podcast on Facebook. And I was really excited because that would bring my friends to about eight. So I opened it up and saw it was from a young man named Muti Johnson. And I didn't know him, so I read the note and it said, I need to join Carl's followers because it's him who has helped me to survive the genocide at Gasimba Memorial Center. He did all his best to save 400 lives, including me. It's hard right now to determine what the impact is on Carl's decision to remain in Rwanda during the genocide, but you fast forward to today and you meet young men like Moody Johnson, who is now getting his degree at the law school in Rwanda. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Carl Wilkins. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, those friendships, you know, they just go and go. Eric, thanks. Where are you, Eric? Eric's so smart in, in you know, who he picked for the last word. You, because you're heading down to the hill. You thought it was me, huh? Well, I, I'm not even sure why Eric picked me to come here um, when it was Sudan. Not that I'm not passionate about Sudan, but I've never visited Sudan. Um, you know, and, and so all the experts, and you're a daunting crowd down there in the front row, just in case you didn't know. You knew that. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the experts of Sudan. I am going to talk a little, I mean, about the specifics. I'm not going to try to talk about what I don't know about. I'm going to try to talk about what I know about, some of my story. And over the last five years, um, Genocide Intervention Network, you know, those kids there, well, sorry, those young people there, um, they're the ones who got me out of, out of my job and starting to travel full time to schools around the country. Um, for 88 nights, I was in the hallway of my house in Rwanda, wonder, weathering if the rest of the world gives a rip. Now I'm out, the rest of the world, and Darfur is raging. So, so for five, ne five years, unfortunately, it's not all been on bicycle. One year, we did do this on bikes. We traveled around to schools. It, it was an ambitious plan. Um, we just made it to, to, from Spokane to Seattle to LA, so it should say 1,600 miles, but that's still not bad. But we were pedaling to schools, telling the stories, and that's what you're gonna, that's what you're gonna hear mostly from me in these last few minutes of this conference, are some stories, because I'm really passionate about the power of stories. I'm passionate about kids like this guy right here, who in eighth grade learned about Holocaust and genocide, and, um, and, and he's like, what can we do? All through high school, he's doing things. In fact, let me, just, let me just give you five things I'm going to talk about really quick. And it uh, looks like I need to get my, my uh, picture over here a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk with you about the cycles, the cycle of stories and service, how, how stories inspire service, how service empowers stories. I'm going to talk to you about the power of presence, sometimes just showing up. I'm going to talk to you about allies. In every crisis, we need an ally. And talk you not about responsibility as much. I like to chop that word in half and turn it around, the ability to respond. We can all argue about who's responsible for the guy broken down on the side of the road, but it's hard to argue with yourself when you say, I got a cell phone. Yeah, I know how to change a tire. So this ability to respond, I think, is a huge part. And the last thing I want to talk about is how people really care. That's why I'm starting with this kid, Jordan, right here. Templeton, California. He sees Ghost of Rwanda. He invites me, not his teachers, not his principals. Jordan invites me to his high school. I've just finished talking to the 800 kids at his high school there. Jordan's senior year, um, Jordan, he invited Desmond Tutu to his school. I mean, you know, it, fortunately, he got a letter back. He just said, Jordan, I'm getting a little too old to accept all the invitations. But Jordan just doesn't, Jordan doesn't think anything's impossible. And, and um, as he was learning about, um, genocides and you know Rwanda and then he learned about Darfur and he's like what are we going to do he goes to a rally in San Jose and he runs into this tall guy who you know five years old you know the story better than better than anybody I usually talk to you know a thousand miles on foot and and Deng is working on his MPH in San Jose and Jordan's like I've been all over the internet I want to go to Sudan and nobody wants me I mean you know all the organizations he's googling everywhere who wants this 18 year old kid with no skills and, and Deng is like, well, shoot, my wife and children are still in Kenya. Come this summer. And Jordan's like, are you serious? And Deng's absolutely. Deng got 20000 bucks to start a clinic back in his home there south of Juba. And, and uh, Jordan raised $3,500 at a restaurant fundraiser in his hometown. And I think under Deng's influence, I mean, 
Okay, all the, all the other seniors are having a senior party a couple days after graduation, not Jordan. He's on a plane in LA, heading 18, heading for Nairobi, where he's gonna jump in a bus with Deng. They go to Kampala, and in Kampala, he'll, under Deng's influence, I'm sure, he's gonna buy 525 mosquito nets, 375 textbooks. Because, you know, uh, well, we all know the killer malaria is. Deng's hiring a truck with cement and, and lumber and everything, and, and here's Jordan just a couple, couple weeks after graduating from high school. On the 20, 29th of June, 2010, he's distrib distributing mosquito nets there. You know, and you gotta either be pregnant or have little ones. He's under a tree. He says, nobody was under the tree when I got there at noon. I mean, the deal was everybody was gonna be there at noon, but, but in any case, soon the, soon the place was full. And I think, if this kid never did anything else, you know, 525 moms, either pregnant or with a baby, that's 1,050 people under a mosquito net, because this kid just, well, he heard some stories and he had to do something. That cycle of stories and service. He built relationships, he had to do something. Um, as he's playing soccer there with the kids, you know, he's like, uh, you know, all of his friends back in America are following this. I can't believe Jordan's in Sudan, you know? And, and, uh, and he's like, there's no difference, you know? We're playing that, that universal language of soccer, no difference. In December, I was in Amman because again, of Jordan. No sound, I'll cut that out. Uh, Jordan is studying uh, at UC Long Beach. His Arabic teachers from Syria tells him what's going on in Syria, and Jordan's like, what are we gonna do? And so Jordan finds a school he can study in Amman, and, and it's an excuse to get to the camps in Syria. Again, Jordan is bringing stories out of Syria all last semester um, to, from his best way, social media and stuff, to let people know the stories and then how can we partner. Jordan got together with others. They raised about $35,000 trying to get people out of these miserably cold tents. And I know this might look good compared to some situations, but, but anyway, the, the, the story goes on. So I'm gonna jump back to Rwanda. I was just there a couple weeks ago. I was with, uh, well, last summer with teachers, some cooperative giraffe. Um, but I was there with theater students from Buff State College in January. They're, they're professors really passionate. And, and I'm bringing this to you because we've got to approach these stories from so many different angles. I hope most of you have taken advantage of the Million Bone Project. I mean, that's another way where we're involving artists. We, we approach this from all angles. This theater professor is really passionate about theater communicating value. And, and, and so after two weeks of being in Rwanda, visiting the memorials, listening to the survivor testimonies, seeing the success stories, the beautiful structures in the city, I mean the construction, you guys, I don't mean to brag, but it's like the ninth fastest growing economy in the world, and don't get me started on this in the universities. But, but after being there and seeing all of that, the kids are now this semester writing a play based on their two week visit to Rwanda. Now I know some, there's been some plays about Darfur already and that's fabulous and stuff, but there's, for so many people, they still haven't heard the story. And so um, in any case, I'll, drive, I'll drop back real quick. 1990, my wife and I with our small children moved to Rwanda. We went there to build schools. We actually met in high school, got married right out of college. That's our wedding invitation. And um, our first two daughters were born in Zimbabwe. I was a high school shop teacher, auto mechanics, welding, Teresa and accountant. And after six years, came back, got an MBA, and the high school shop teacher MBA combined, that's what I would say today, international development degree, um, we went to Rwanda. And we were building schools, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. We were there for four years before the genocide. Our home, really comfortable. The kids were playing, that's just a picture a couple weeks ago, how the scenery has changed in the city of Kigali. But um, our kids were playing for four years with the neighborhood kids. Everybody thinks their kids are cute, but our whole neighborhood thought our kids were cute. And, and, and they were just, oh, little, what's this, a birthday party with a three-legged race, or somebody donated a boat to a hospital. We had to test it. I nailed a couple tennis shoes on a couple boards. Um, Rwanda was, and I say still is, a wonderful place to raise children. But we all know, I don't need to give you the background of those dark days when uh, you zoom down. This is our neighborhood, our house, surrounded by these little mud, mud brick tin roof homes. We heard the plane crash from our house. Um, we didn't know what the explosion was there, April 6, 1994, but we found out pretty quick. The next day, they're killing our neighbors. We see them walking down the street in front of our house, carrying the couch, television, microwave from our neighbors. And that night, we're tucking our kids in bed. Not in bed, we're actually putting them to bed in the hallway, 
because you can't be in your bedroom. You've got to be away from the windows, all the gunfire and stuff. So as we're settling our kids down for bed, we have no idea gathering at our gate is a band of what's now become a very well-known word, intrahamwe. This killing squad, the militia is there gathering at our gate. Not because we're Tutsi, it's just the time of chaos. It's a, it's a target of opportunity. And out of these little mud brick tin roof homes, where our kids have been playing for four years, where their kids have been on our living room floor playing Legos, watching Sesame Street videos and stuff. Out of these homes come these women who, who are really extraordinary. I mean, I'd say if they're ordinary, they would stay in their house taking care of their kids. Isn't that what, isn't that what you do, your first responsibility, your family? But these women, as they heard that a gang was gathering at our gate, they courageously came out. And they stood between these guys with clubs, with machetes, adrenaline racing through them. Perhaps their pants barely pulled up what they've been doing in the neighborhood. And I don't know what they would have done at our house. I figured it at, at probably rob us. But our neighbors, when we talked to them later, this picture is probably 10 years after the genocide, they said, no, no, they, they would have killed you. I've told this story more than a thousand times. I, 250 times a year I'm telling this story in schools around the world now. And I still get this lump in my throat when I think about those women. Not armed with guns, not armed with machetes, but armed with stories. You understand why I'm so passionate about stories? They start telling these guys with the clubs and the machetes about our family, stories about our kids, and, and, and how you know, this lady was having her baby at home like most women do and it didn't come right and they knocked on our door in the middle of the night and of course we took them to the hospital, you know, used our car. Just little neighborly things. These stories, these stories are the most powerful thing we possess. Anybody comes with a gun, there'll be a bigger gun. Anybody comes with a bomb, there'll be a bigger bomb. But stories have the potential to change the way we think, which can change the way we feel, which can change the way we act. That's why when Greg was talking yesterday about the power of love, we're talking about something sustainable. And if we ever needed something sustainable for Sudan, it's now a sustainable strategy. So it's okay when some people present strategies of violence and other people present strategies of nonviolence. We all need to be at the table. Those who are pro-life need people who are pro-choice at the table because they bring things that the others don't bring. But, but let's welcome people, let's value each other's stories. In any case, they never came in. The women basically, comrades, Graham and Malinzi, they were kids on our living room floor. The women basically said their kids play with our kids. And these guys moved on. We didn't know until the next morning. And I obviously don't have time to go into much more of the story. But as the foreigners were leaving, these are clips out of the documentary Ghost of Rwanda, if you get a chance. Um, these are frames from that documentary. As the foreigners are leaving, my wife and I, we go in the bedroom. We hold each other, we're forehead to forehead, we're talking, we're praying. We'd already made the decision that I would stay, but now we gotta do it. And, and uh, this young lady was at the center of the decision. She'd lived in our home for three years. She loved our kids. Shoot, you wanna make a deposit in someone's heart? Love their kids. You wanna know why Rwanda is doing so well today? Because they've said, a minimum of 30% of the decision makers in our country are going to be women. That's why the country is doing so well. There's a lot of other things, but that core, the role that women are playing, and, and, and that idea that, that you know it's going to be okay and it's going to be okay for a long time, there's a, there's a way that women can communicate that. And, 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 and so this young lady didn't ask me. And the young man who was our watchman, a young man, by the way, who hid in our home throughout the genocide, years later would go to Darfur as a peacekeeper. One of your peacekeepers in Darfur was hiding in my house during the Rwandan genocide. That's powerful to me. And, and it was powerful when yesterday Mukesh said to me, some who've served time for genocide in Rwanda and, 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 and have done, you can't really say done their time, I almost said that. But there's actually some of them, he was told last time he was there, who are serving as peacekeepers. People who committed genocide serving as peacekeepers? What in the world? Stories. They can inspire service. It can empower. So my wife and I made the decision that I would stay, and hopefully my presence. Remember, we were talking about this power of presence. Not so much what you say, not so much what you do so often, it's just simply being there. Hopefully my presence would make a difference. And she took the kids. You see the kids, they're not terrified. Lisa, were you afraid her legs crossed? No. Why not? Because mom wasn't afraid. 
that role that women play, the girl effect. Oh, I'll, I'll go there for a long time. In any case, as, uh, oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering why we didn't take the young lady with us, um, the American Embassy made it really clear, no Rwandans in the vehicle. And, and, and in the, if you have Rwandans in the vehicles, it'll endanger everybody's life. And, and I understand some of their reasoning, but I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna contrast something here with you. You know, I skipped over this ID card back here. They're saying that people are killing somebody just based on their ID card. That's what people who commit genocide do, they're insane. But, but then, as we're coming as an international community to respond to this situation, if you can show us you're not Rwandan, we'll help you out. Show us your Ugandan documents, show us your Egyptian documents, show us your Korean documents, we'll help you leave the country. If you're Rwandan, sorry. Do you not see the insanity? Huh? This, this labeling, anytime something diminishes to a label, well, the, bowl, the bell tolls for us all. Um, Teresa took the kids to Nairobi. She didn't want to go any farther than she had to. And, and every day during the genocide, we got to talk on a ham radio. And let me say, the people at the American Embassy in Nairobi were fabulous. It's so important that we break down who we're talking about. If we're talking about, you know, the UN, or, or for example, we talk about the UN soldiers who stayed in Rwanda, those courageous men, some of them who lost their lives. But, but in any case, she got to go to the embassy. They bent the rules. We got to talk every day on the radio, an incredible gift. Um, this guy is, is one guy I want to talk to when we talk about allies. He was arrested, he was tried in Arusha, he's serving life prison, uh, a life sentence in prison, in a West African prison. Um, as the extremists took over the country, the president is killed, the prime minister is assassinated, they, they put in their own people, they leave this man in charge of the capital city, Kigali. And so the, the extremist leaders get out, Kigali's fighting is too heavy, they move to Gitarama, but they leave this guy in charge. After three weeks of being stuck in my home, he makes an announcement on the radio, if you've got a legitimate reason to be out, come to my office. And I form a relationship with this man throughout the genocide. He's the man who directs me to Gisimba Orphanage. Johnson, who Corey was telling you about, the young man studying law today, Johnson had fled from a nearby home to this orphanage. From 80 kids, it grew to over 400 kids. And as I came in the gate of this orphanage, fresh little graves, parking lot becoming a cemetery, not from machetes and clubs, but as we heard earlier, this, this weapon of, well, the kids were dying there, diarrhea, dysentery, and, and how, how starvation doesn't get the headlines. And, and we've heard a lot of valuable stuff these last couple of days. And so, so during those three weeks of the genocide, I did my best to bring water and food and medicine to three groups of orphans. When I bought powdered milk from thieves who had stolen it from stores, other allies, I had no place to take my car, my little Toyota Corolla loaded with powdered milk, except to this guy's office. I said, Renzaho, I need storage space. If I take it all to the orphanage, they'll rob it. If I take it home, they'll rob me. So he gave me storage space, and, and the story can go on. I need a vehicle. Half the day I'm using a vehicle he gave me, the other half the killers are using the vehicle to do their stuff. And later I got another vehicle, and on and on the stories go. I'll wrap with, um, oh, just to let you know, the young lady did survive, and, and most of her family didn't, like so many stories in Rwanda, but like so many other stories, stories in Rwanda, she married a man whose ID card said Hutu. Her whole family killed, she marries a man who's like, and, and, and when you talk to her about that, she's like, well, we're all God's children. Don't you know that? Hmm. Some of the kids at the orphanage who have grown up lawyers, she's a health worker, Kevin's a lawyer, Grace is an electrical engineer, Bosco's an artist, but um, I want to end with this concept with the stories. That's what I want to send you out with. Some of you recognize this guy. Hmm? Boy out there, getting the stories out of the Nuba Mountains. One of, one of the ladies asked yesterday, what, what can we do? What can we as Sudanese do? You remember the question? <laughs> Soon as one of you ladies stands up like Hawa and I were together in Philadelphia and, and, and she says, I'm from Sudan. Whoa. The whole auditorium becomes silent. You have their attention. The power of presence and the power of stories and, and recognizing. John, I appreciated what you said about choosing our words right because so many times in the activist community, it's easy to pick words that inflame and, and get the momentum going and get the applause going and stuff like that. But what are they doing besides that? Besides inflaming and getting the applause going? How are we building relationships? The, the choice of our words is so important when we tell stories because, yeah, it, we can get a lot of applause and stuff for choosing certain words, 
but they don't build relationships. And, and, and then with stories, there's a huge part about listening. And, and, and so stories isn't just talking, the listening part. And, and uh, I was just, in, I enjoyed yesterday learning about the, the Darfur, United for Darfur team. And I think as we head out of here, all of our different passions, um, a friend of ours, she, she learned about genocide. She started a dance school in Rwanda and Ghana and, and Bosnia. And, and all of our, these little kids have come off the streets in Kigali to, um, to learn dance. Two days a week, they are, they are studying dance. Three days a week, they're studying English. When we take our passion, what we're passionate about, and we see the great needs, and where those two intersect, we find our place, that's sustainable because that's our passion and those needs are there and and as you see these little kids and, and the instructor says this is their own thing he said you know their own choreography and everything else and, and it's like they're getting their childhood back because we know how the street we know how genocide robs the childhood so so i make this plug and i know it's to the choir but i hope as you as you take it out there that we've got to be doing all of these approaches it's not just one approach in terms of food and, and the safety is so important in the shelter, but all of the different dimensions we've got to, we've got to use as we, I hate to cut these kids off, <laughs> as we come out of here. One little resource, and, and it's so easy, guys. We just, um, we just, when we're on Facebook, you all know this, I'm sure, but you know, I often say, take this one, you know, Jeremy Rifkin, people care. And uh, we just take that little link, Command C, and we come over here to Facebook, to our page, and uh, it says, um, write something, absolutely. People care, Command V, there it is. See, every time we hear a story, even one little action like that is moving in a direction of peace. So I'm really glad to have been here with you all. I have uh, more stories, but time's up. Thank you for coming. And thank you for what you're going to be doing now on Capitol Hill. And I hope we'll cross paths again real soon. And we'll be having this celebration about peace in Darfur the next time.